Now, let's turn to uh, talking about some broad approaches, broad research methods, schools of methods, experimental methods, survey methods, observational methods. Now, before we get started, let me point out that we are talking about broad schools of approaches here. Within each of these categories, you're going to find many variations of experiments, survey designs, many approaches or uh, uh, methods within the broad heading of observational research. Again, we're kind of boiling things down and really talking broad strokes here, and we're not going to get caught up in all these details. Also, let me point out that uh, the lines between these categories are not hard and fast. A lot of times people mix and match methods, coming up with all sorts of hybrids, maybe borrowing some experimental techniques and using them with surveys, or maybe doing an experiment, and then after the experiment debriefing subjects and effectively giving them a survey for some reason. Uh, a lot of times people mix and match these various approaches. It's not like you just do one or the other or the other. And finally, let me point out that there's a whole bunch of other approaches that aren't on this board. I've tried to pick three big research approaches, broad research approaches, that are widely used in sociology and the other social sciences. Experimental methods tend to be a lot more popular in areas like psychology than in sociology, but sociologists sometimes do experiments and it's not exactly uh, you know, unusual to see it. We definitely do lots of surveys, and that's critical for us, particularly macro sociologists, because macro sociologists are interested in looking at the big picture. How do we study large scale social phenomena, trends, patterns? How do we get that data? Well, a lot of times surveys may be the only practical way to get that kind of data. Uh, you can't put everyone in the laboratory, even if you wanted to. And finally, Observational research is also very common in our discipline, more in micro-sociology. It's also very popular in some other social sciences like anthropology. At any rate, the major point here is to, to uh, uh, make, basically reinforce an earlier point that we do have trade-offs here. First of all, let's talk about internal validity. Recall that internal validity is all about the rigor of your research, whether you're logically, rigorously testing causal theories, for example. With good research, uh, pardon me, good internal validity, you should be able to have confidence in your research results. Yes, this theory worked. No, that theory didn't work. Uh, we can tell whether a theory's predictions were falsified or, or supported by the way you did your research. If that's the case, you have good internal validity. In terms of these broad methods, the strongest method in terms of internal validity are experimental methods, exactly because you can use powerful techniques like uh, random assignment. You can create your own control groups, experimental groups. You can control the physical and social environments in very complex ways so that you can control variables, eliminate or minimize spuriousness, deal with figuring out which way the arrow of causation points. Remember, external validity uh, a lot of times ties back to issues that we talked about in terms of testing causal theories and those basic criteria. Well, if that's what you're interested in, experimental research is a, just about as good as it gets. Now, don't think that just because somebody does an experiment that it necessarily has good internal validity. It all depends on, well, how it's done. And some experiments, frankly, are poorly conducted, poorly executed, poorly planned. But a well-executed, well-designed uh, experimental piece of research is about as good as it gets in terms of internal validity. Survey research, exactly because you can control for a lot of variables using uh, questions and eliciting data, at least doing statistical kinds of controls, sometimes being able to use a few other tricks along the way. We can deal with uh, some of the basic issues involved in internal validity. We can test causal theories. And we do it all the time, but usually it's not quite as rigorous in terms of internal validity, and there's always going to be some questions about uh, whether the results really should be interpreted as a, as a clear uh, test of a theory, or uh, sometimes there's a little confusion on what the results really mean. That's kind of built into the way you do the research, because survey research usually isn't as strong as experimental research in terms of internal validity. Now, observational research usually is the weakest of the three methods in terms of internal validity. Why so? 
because you're just stunning people out in the real world. You're not able to create your own groups and control the air temperature or control much of anything. You're not able to use random assignment. For that matter, you can't even really go out and elicit tons of information using surveys that you've carefully created and tested in the past. Instead, you're watching people. Now, you may do it in a very methodical, pre-planned way. There is better and worse observational research. And there's a lot of observational methods to help you get better data. But at the end of the day, your ability to uh, rigorously test theories and more generally get good internal validity is probably the most limited in terms of observational research. What about external validity? Remember, external validity is different than internal validity. External validity focuses on generalizing results to large populations of people you haven't studied. It's all about generating representative samples that look like or are similar to some larger population of people who you really want to talk about. Usually experiments tend to have fairly poor external validity. Usually they don't even attempt to use any kind of random sampling. They tend to use convenience sampling and so forth. So they're not really in a, a good situation to generalize their results. However rigorous the results, however valid the results, they're just not in a good position to generalize those results to other people they didn't study. Survey research uh, is probably the strongest method in terms of external validity. Again, it doesn't always work that way. Either due to bad luck or poor uh, sampling design or execution, sometimes surveys generate horribly biased, unrepresentative samples. But if you're going to get good external validity, if you're going to study a few people and then talk about large numbers of people, uh, be able to extrapolate your results to a large group of people you didn't study, survey research usually is about as good as it gets. Now, once again, observational research typically is not that good in terms of external validity. A lot of times you're going out and you're studying very specific groups of people in specific times and places. You study groups of Hell's Angels in one town or a group of Mormons somewhere else or some other group of people in one other place or another. Well, you may learn a lot about that specific chapter of the Hell's Angels or that particular group of Mormons, but at the end of the day, that's all you've studied, that specific group. Is what you've studied applicable to other groups even the same groups, more or less, in other places or at other times? The answer is you can't really be confident. You certainly can't make strong statements that, well, these people are very similar to these other people. If you do so, you're basing it on a hope and a prayer, and your external validity is always open to serious debate. Now here we have a third category that I call realism. It's sometimes called ecological validity in uh, psychology. It has to do with how realistic your research is. Are you studying people in their everyday circumstances, behaving and reacting as they normally do? Or are you studying them under some kind of circumstance that's very artificial, unusual, very different than their day-to-day -day lives? Now, this is an, uh, uh, an area that usually isn't focused on nearly as much in methodology, but it is sometimes very, very critical. And I point out that a, a lot of times, Ex, uh, experiments can be weak in, in terms of realism. After all, bringing people into a laboratory, poking them and prodding them, watching them, that is a very unusual circumstance. You're not really studying people under normal conditions. And also remember you're studying self-aware subjects. They may very well know that they are guinea pigs in an experiment, subjects in an experiment. And that by itself may change their reactions. Again, you may not really be studying how they really behave in the real world. And that is a serious question when you take the results from your research and talk about behavior in the real world outside the lab. Now, surveys, I put a question mark because frankly, it's a little hard to tell sometimes. Sometimes surveys may very well capture what people really are doing, what they're thinking. Uh, if you ask them questions that are not only well written and pertinent and relevant to these people's lives, but also questions that, frankly, people already have some experience with. They, they know something about it. They do have opinions and beliefs about these things. In those cases, you may get quite a bit of realism in your research. On the other hand, surveys that ask questions about things that people aren't familiar with, they're outside their experience, that people are uncomfortable with, 
Those kinds of questions, or simply questions that are poorly written sometimes, can be very unrealistic, very artificial. And once again, people know that they're being studied. People know they're being quizzed and questioned. And that, too, can influence their reactions. Again, raises some serious questions about how realistic the information you're getting is, whether it really pertains to how people really live in the real world. The last uh, uh, example here is observational research under realism. And that's one of the great strengths of observational research. Now, there's different approaches in terms of observational research. Sometimes you actually tell people that you're studying them. Uh, but other cases, you may become a fly on the wall, engage in participant, non-obtrusive observation. You may blend into a group, become one with them, watch them and listen to them, and they may not even know they're being studied. You're not influencing or contaminating their behavior. They don't believe they're being studied. And more importantly, they're just doing what they normally do. They're not in a laboratory and they're not sitting down writing answers on a questionnaire. They're just living their life. In that respect, you may very well be studying them in a very naturalistic, realistic kind of environment. And this question about whether your research and your research results really uh, applies to people in the real world is a lot stronger, that, that claim that, yes, this is how these people really live. This is how they think. This is how they feel. This is how they interact. Exactly because that's how and where you're studying them. Now, one more comment in terms of research methods. A lot of times, it's useful to study particular topics, uh, uh, theories, and so forth, using a variety of different methods, using what are sometimes called methodological triangulation testing theories and doing research using different methods and asking similar or the same questions using different methods. The point is, is that each of these different methods has different strengths and weaknesses, but if they start giving you uh, kind of consistent results, reinforcing results, it actually is very strong evidence that your research is going somewhere and maybe your theories are useful. If they give you conflicting results, it gives you clues that maybe you need to, to reevaluate your theories or approach your research in different ways. At least you're going to get lots of information that might cause you to kind of rethink how you're approaching the problem. Also, I'll point out that it helps to have replication of research, whatever method you're using. Exactly because these uh, uh, various research methods are imperfect, you always run into problems, and even the best conducted, best planned research, the best executed research, sometimes goes awry. Well, because that's true, we need replication, and frankly, we need competition in research. Different groups of people approaching problems, sometimes from the same angle, sometimes from different angles, and doing independent research, repeating and replicating that research to make sure you keep getting more or less the same results every time you ask the same question to the same kinds of people. Well, that ends our discussion of methodology. I thank you very much for listening and watching it, and uh, you may or may not see more videos this semester, but we will see uh, you in class. Thank you very much.